Good morning. Welcome to this special edition of Abundant Life Church. Yes. We welcome you, Facebook family, yes. and just worship with us this morning, wherever you are.
and worship team and thank all of you who are watching or will be watching you can tell everything's a little different uh, we had no electricity in the building uh, this morning so when our faithful team began arriving before eight uh, we were aware we had to do something the experts were called in and now we have a few lights flickering but here we are it's Palm Sunday. It uh, makes us uh, think back to COVID days. There were eight or 10 Sundays when our doors were locked and the only people inside the church building were our faithful skeleton crew, our singers, musicians, our tech people. And uh, uh, so we had just a few standing around here in the lobby where we do have some light. So. Uh, it is Palm Sunday. It's a most significant day in the life of the church, in the life of every believer, and certainly in the life of our Lord. I do have a word this morning that's appropriate for Palm Sunday. Our service will be abbreviated, but you will get the point. Let's pray. Father, thank you for being good to your people always. Thank you that the word of the Lord is not limited by electricity made by man. But thank you that the word of the Lord is spoken with power. And I speak a blessing over every member and friend of Abundant Life Church. On this significant day in church history, we have an open heaven above our heads. And it's easy to hear you speak to us today. And as we hear your word our faith increases, and we're able to believe you for more than ever by faith. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. and amen. I do want to say that uh, some of you are commenting online, texting. I did get a great text from one of our faithful intercessors, Miss Charlie Moore, texted this out uh, just a minute or two ago. My new confession for Abundant Life Church is that there is so much power the transformer could not handle it so okay i'm going with that <laughs> uh, and uh, let it be so i want to begin by reading one verse of scripture and i will be brief this morning in zechariah chapter 9 
and verse 9. 500 years before Christ was born, the prophet wrote these words. Rejoice, O people of Zion. Shout in triumph, O people of Jerusalem. Look, your king is coming to you. He is righteous and victorious, yet he is humble, riding on a donkey, riding on a donkey's colt. That was the word God gave his prophet five centuries before prophecy became history. I want to ask you this question. What would you do if you knew you had less than a week to live? Jesus faced that on Palm Sunday. On this day in church history, he rode into Jerusalem on this donkey that had been prophesied 500 years earlier. And when he came into the town to the great parade and the fanfare of the crowds that were there to celebrate the annual Passover feast, he knew when he entered the city he had less than a week to live. Now, we have walked with people who've been given a diagnosis like that from a doctor, even some of our family members. How sad it is when any of our loved ones are given that diagnosis from a doctor. You have less than a week to live. But Jesus, being healthy, knew his time was at hand. What would be on your to-do list if you knew you had less than a week to live? Well, in Jesus' last days on earth, he spent time in prayer. I would be doing that. That would be on my to-do list. In fact, the Bible says he found a solitary place several times during that last week and prayed alone. And on one occasion during that last week, he continued all night in prayer. And then another thing I would do if I knew I had less than a week to live, as Jesus knew on that first Palm Sunday, I would revisit my purpose. Why did God place me here? Would I be able to say when I took my last breath what Jesus said when he prayed in the garden, Father, I have accomplished everything you've sent me to do. I would make sure my purpose was being completed in my final days and in my final hours. And then thirdly, I would do what Jesus did on this point. He spent time with family and close friends. He enjoyed the Last Supper with his closest friends and he shared with them at that last supper knowing this is the last meal I will have with my closest friends my disciples my followers before my death and in that meal he shared with them how he wanted to be remembered and he did it so simply all they had for that meal was bread and wine. And he took the bread at the Last Supper and he broke it and blessed it. And he commanded his disciples to eat of it. And he said, this is my body. And then he lifted the cup of wine and he blessed it. And he instructed the disciples who shared that last meal with him to drink it drink all of it and he said do this often and every time you do this do it in remembrance of me it was important to him how he would be remembered and the last meal is his choice 
for his memory. Now today is Palm Sunday. There would be no shout in the camp if even we had full electricity in the building. By design, this is the day that begins Passion Week. It is a sobering occasion. It is the most somber occasion. As we begin today, Palm Sunday, retracing the steps of Jesus through the last week he lived on earth before he died and was raised back to life. We will look again this week every day at his suffering, at his passion. Before they crucified him, they tortured him. That had to be worse than death itself. Torturing and putting to shame the Son of God. Now, the Old Testament prophet Zechariah prophesied this would happen. And 500 years later, in the New Testament, Mark's gospel, the 11th chapter, prophecy became history. In verse 1, it says, Now when they drew near to Jerusalem, to Bethpage and Bethany, at the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples. And he said to them, Go into the village opposite you, and as soon as you have entered in it, you will find a colt tied, which no one has set upon. Loose it and bring it. And if anyone says to you, Why are you doing this? Say, The Lord has need of it. And immediately he will send it here. So they went their way and found the colt tied by the door outside of the street. And they loosed it. But some of those who stood there said to them, What are you doing loosing the colt? And they spoke to them just as Jesus had commanded and so they let them go. Then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their clothes on it, and he sat on it. And many spread their clothes on the road. Others cut down leafy branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And then those who went before and those who followed cried out, saying, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the kingdom of of our father David that comes in the name of the Lord Hosanna in the highest. The word Hosanna is a Hebrew word meaning save us now. That's what the crowd was saying on that first Palm Sunday when Jesus historically rode into Jerusalem on a donkey. The crowd wanted to make him king they wanted him to be their king, to set them free from the oppression of the Roman government whose military was occupying Israel at that time. God's people had been oppressed for so long, and now Jesus is here, the Messiah, the king that had been prophesied for centuries. And so when they cried out, Hosanna! They were saying to Jesus, save us now. Save us now. And he rode on a donkey humbly instead of a great white stallion, which the kings in that day would have chosen for their parades citywide. But Jesus instead chose humility over pomp and circumstances expected at a big festival when he was being called king. They were in town, some people think two million people from all over Israel were in Jerusalem that day because it was the annual Passover celebration. It was a large crowd, many faces in the crowd, many attitudes in the crowd. There were some in the crowd who loved him and were ready to crown him king. There were others in the, crowd, in the crowd who hated him, despised him, had mocked him. There were supporters in the crowd. There was opposition in the crowd. There were believers and there were skeptics. There were people in the crowd who were committed to following him, 
there were some though who were confused and some were there just because they were curious. The Bible says some in the crowd had seen Jesus call Lazarus from the tomb and raised Lazarus back to life. Some in the crowd had been with him and had eaten the bread and the fish. He miraculously multiplied when there was a need. Some in the crowd had tasted the wine he had turned from water at the wedding feast. So many people in the crowd and the Jewish people from all over the nation were there on that eventful day. Now when little Jewish boys and girls were growing up in what was their Sunday school or what was their children's church, the Jewish boys and girls in the day of Jesus had already been taught some of the scriptures. They had already been taught about Adam and Eve in the garden. They knew the story of Noah and the ark. They knew the story of Moses parting the Red Sea. They had been taught the story of Abraham offering his son Isaac as a sacrifice. And they had been taught one of these days the Messiah is coming. God's son and he's going to deliver us he's going to save us from our oppressors they grew up knowing that day would come and all of the prophecies over 300 prophecies began being fulfilled on that first Palm Sunday when Jesus rode into town on a donkey and the crowd was screaming, save us now. This is the week we remember his suffering and remember the torture that was inflicted upon his physical body before they killed him. Crucifixion is a merciless execution. It would have been far more merciful if they had beheaded him. It would have been quick and a lot less agonizing. But they spit upon him. They whipped him 39 times. They abused him and kicked him and mocked him to the point that the prophet Isaiah said when they were finished torturing him, he would not be recognizable as the man he was. He was a bloody mess when they finally nailed him to the cross and even there, he faced hours of torture and pain before death occurred. I want to read a good bit of scripture in closing from the message translation. This is just a part of what happened when Jesus had less than a week to live. When Jesus finished these sayings, he told his disciples, you know that Passover comes in two days. That's when the Son of Man will be betrayed and handed over for crucifixion. Betrayed and handed over. Betrayed and handed over. At that very moment, the party of high priests and religious leaders was meeting in the chambers of the chief priest named Cyphus, conspiring to seize Jesus and kill him. They agreed that it should not be done during Passover week. We don't want a riot on our hands, they said. When Jesus was at Bethany, 
a guest of Simon the leper, a woman came up to him as he was eating dinner and anointed him with a bottle of very expensive perfume. When the disciples saw what was happening, they were furious. That's criminal. This could have been sold for a lot of money and given to the poor. When Jesus realized what was going on, he intervened. Why are you giving this woman a hard time? She has just done something wonderfully significant for me. You will have the poor with you every day for the rest of your lives, but not me. When she poured this perfume on my body, what she really did was anoint me for burial. You can be sure that wherever in the whole world the message is preached, what she has just done is going to be remembered and admired. That is when one of the twelve, the one named Judas, went to the Kabul of high priest and said, what will you give me if I hand him over to you? They settled on 30 pieces of silver. Judas began looking for the right moment to hand him over. On the first of the days of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus and said, where do you want us to prepare your Passover meal? He said, enter the city, Go up to a certain man and say, The teacher says my time is near and I and my disciples plan to celebrate the Passover meal at your house. The disciples followed Jesus' instructions to the letter and prepared the Passover meal. After sunset, he and the twelve were sitting around the table. During the meal, he said, I, I have something hard but important to say to you. One of you is going to hand me over to the conspirators. They were stunned and they began to ask one after another, It isn't me, is it, Master? And Jesus answered, The one who hands me over is someone I eat with daily. One who passes me food at the table. In one sense, the Son of Man is entering into a way of treachery well marked by the scriptures, no surprises here. In another sense, that man who turns him in turns traitor to the Son of Man. Better never to have been born than to do this. Then Judas, already turned traitor, said, It isn't me, is it, Rabbi? Jesus said, don't play games with me, Judas. During the meal, Jesus took and blessed the bread, broke it, and gave it to his disciples. Take this, he said. Eat it. This is my body. Take the cup. And thanking God for it, he gave it to them. Drink this, all of you. This is my blood. God's new covenant poured out for many people for the forgiveness of sins. Then Jesus said to them, I'll not be drinking wine from this cup again until that new day when I'll drink with you in the kingdom of my Father. They sang a psalm and went directly to the Mount of Olives. Then Jesus told them, Before this night is over, you're going to fall to pieces because of what happens to me. There is a scripture that says, The shepherd will be striped, and the sheep will be scattered. But after I am raised up, I, your shepherd, will go ahead of you, leading the way to Galilee. Peter broke in. Even if everyone else falls to pieces on account of you, I won't. Don't be so sure, Jesus said. This very night before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times before sunrise. Peter protested. Even if I had to die with you, I would never deny you. And all the others said the same thing. Then Jesus went with them to a garden called Gethsemane and told his disciples, stay here while I go there and pray. Taking along Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, he plunged into an agonizing sorrow. Then he said, 
The sorrow is crushing my life out of me. Stay here and keep vigil with me. Going a little ahead, he, held, he fell on his face praying, My father, if there is any way, get me out of this. But, please, not what I want. You do what you want. When he came back to his disciples, he found them sound asleep. He said to Peter, can't you stick it out with me a single hour? Stay alert, be in prayer so you won't wander into temptation without even knowing you're in danger. There is a part of you that is eager, ready for anything in God, but there's another part that's as lazy as an old dog sleeping by the fire. He then left them a second time. Again, he prayed, my father, if there is no other way than this, drinking this cup, I'm ready. Do it your way. When he came back, he again found his disciples sound asleep. They simply couldn't keep their eyes open. This time, he let them sleep. And he went back a third time to pray, going over the same ground one last time. And when he came back the next time, he said, are you going to sleep on and make a night of it? My time is up. The Son of Man is about to be handed over to the hands of sinners. Get up. Let's get going. My betrayer is here. And the words were barely out of his mouth when Judas, one of the twelve, showed up. And with him a gang from the high priest and the religious leaders, brandishing swords, and clubs. The betrayer had worked out a sign with them. The one that I kiss, that's the one. Seize him. Judas went straight to Jesus, greeted him. How are you, Rabbi? And kissed him. And Jesus said, why this charade? And then they came on him, grabbed him, and roughed him up. One of those with Jesus pulled his sword and taking a swing at the chief priest's servant, cut off his ear. And Jesus said, put your sword back where it belongs. All who use swords are destroyed by swords. Don't you realize that I'm able right now to call my father? And 12 companies, more if I want them, of fighting angels would be here battle ready. But if I did that, how would the scriptures come true that say this is the way it has to be? Then Jesus addressed the mob. What is this coming out after me with swords and clubs as if I were a criminal? Day after day I've been sitting in the temple teaching and you never so much as lifted a hand against me. You've done it this way to confirm and fulfill the prophetic writings. Then all of his disciples cut and ran. The gang that had seized Jesus led him before Caiaphas, the chief priest, and the religion scholars and leaders had assembled. Peter followed at a safe distance until they got to the chief priest's courtyard. Then he slipped in and mingled with the servants, watching to see how things would turn out. The high priest, conspiring with the Jewish council, tried to cook up charges against Jesus in order to sentence him to death. But even though many stepped in making up one false accusation after another, nothing was believable. Finally, two men came forward with this. He said, I can tear down the temple of God and after three days rebuild it. The chief priest stood up and said, what do you have to say to this accusation? Jesus kept silent. Then the chief priest said, I command you by the authority of the living God to say if you are the Messiah, the Son of God. Jesus replied, you said it, and soon you'll see it for yourself. You said it. And soon, you'll see it for yourself. 
At that time, the chief priest lost his temper, ripping his robes, yelling, He's blasphemed. Why do we need witnesses to accuse him? You all heard him blaspheme. Are you going to stand for such blasphemy? And they all said, Death. That seals his death sentence. Then they were spitting in his face and banging him around. They jeered as they slapped him. Prophesy, Messiah. Who hit you that time? All this time, Peter was sitting out in the courtyard. One servant girl came up to him and said, You were with Jesus the Galilean. In front of everybody there, Peter denied it. I don't know what you're talking about. As he moved over toward the gate, someone else said to the people there, This man was with Jesus the Nazarene. And again, Peter denied it, salting his denial with an oath. I swear, I've never laid eyes on that man. Shortly after that, some bystanders approached Peter. You've got to be one of them. Your accent gives you away. And then he really got nervous and swore. I don't know the man. Just then, the rooster crowed. Peter remembered what Jesus had said, that before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. He went out and cried. In the first light of dawn the next morning, all the high priest and religious leaders met and put the finishing touches on their plot to kill Jesus. Then they tied him up and paraded him to Pilate, the governor. Judas, the one who betrayed him, realized that Jesus was doomed. And overcome with remorse, he gave back the 30 silver coins to the high priest saying, I've sinned, I've betrayed an innocent man. They said, what do we care? That's your problem. Judas threw the silver coins into the temple and left. Then he went out and hung himself. The high priest picked up the silver pieces but then didn't know what to do with them. It wouldn't be right to give this a payment for murder as an offering in the temple. So they decided to get rid of it by buying the potter's field and using it as a burial place for foreigners and homeless people. That's how the field got its name, a name that is stuck to this day. Then Jeremiah's words became history. They took 30 pieces of silver, the price of the one priced by some sons of Israel, and they purchased the potter's field. And so they unwittingly followed the divine instructions to the letter. Jesus was placed before the governor who questioned him, are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus said, if you say so. But when the accusations rained hot and heavy, from the high priest and the religious leaders, he said nothing. Pilate asked him, do you hear that long list of accusations? Aren't you going to say something? Jesus kept silence, not a word from his mouth. The governor was impressed. It was an old custom during the feast for the governor to pardon a single prisoner named by the crowd. At that time, they had the infamous Barabbas in prison. With the crowd before him, Pilate, the governor, said, Which prisoner do you want me to pardon? Jesus or Barabbas? He knew it was through sheer spite that they had turned Jesus over to him. While court was still in session, Pilate's wife sent him a message and said, don't get mixed up in judging this noble man. I've just been through a long and troubled night because of a dream I had about him. Meanwhile, the high priest and religious leaders had talked the crowd into asking for Barabbas to be pardoned and for Jesus to be executed. The governor said, which of the two do you want me to pardon? They said, Barabbas, then what do I do with Jesus, the Christ? And they all shouted, nail him to a cross. 
He objected. But for what crime? What has he done wrong? And they all yelled the louder, nail him to a cross. When Pilate saw that he was getting nowhere and that the riot was imminent, he took a basin of water and washed his hands in full sight of the crowd, saying, I'm washing my hands of responsibility for this man's death. From now on, it's in your hands. You are the judge and jury. And the crowd answered, we'll take the blame. We and our children after us. Then the governor pardoned Barabbas, but he had but he had Jesus whipped and then handed over for crucifixion. The soldiers assigned to the governor took Jesus into the palace and got the entire brigade together for some fun. They stripped him and dressed him in a red toga. They plaited a crown of branches with thorns and set it on his head. They put a stick in his right hand as a pretend scepter. Then they knelt before him in mocking reverence. Bravo, king of the Jews, they said, mocking him. Bravo. Then they spit on him and hit him on the head with the stick. And when they had had their fun, they took off the toga and put his own clothes back on him. And then they proceeded out to the crucifixion. Along the way, they came on a man named Cyrene and made him carry Jesus' cross. Arriving at Golgotha, the place they call Skull Hill, they offered him a mild painkiller, a mixture of wine and myrrh, but when he tasted it, he wouldn't drink it. After they had finished nailing him to the cross and were waiting for him to die, they whiled away the time by throwing dice for his clothes. Above his head, they had posted a mockery a sign of a criminal. This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Along with him, they also crucified two criminals, one on his right, the other on the left. People passing along the road jeered, shaking their hands in mock lament. You bragged that you could tear down the temple and rebuild it in three days. So show us your stuff. Save yourselves. If you're really God's son, come down from that cross. The high priest, along with the religion, scholars, and leaders, were right there mixing it up with the rest of them, having a great time poking fun at him. He saved others. He can't even save himself. King of Israel, do you think? Then they let him get down from the cross. Well, all became believers then. He was so sure of God. Well, let him rescue his son now, if he wants him. He did claim to be God's son, didn't he? Even the two criminals crucified next to him joined in the mockery. From noon until three, the whole earth was dark. Around mid-afternoon, Jesus groaned out of the depths, crying loudly, My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Some bystanders who heard him said, he's calling for Elijah. One of them ran and got a sponge soaked with sour wine and lifted it on a stick so he could drink. And the others joked, don't be in such a hurry. Let's see if Elijah comes and saves him. But Jesus, again crying out loudly, breathed his last. At that moment, the temple curtain was ripped in two from top to bottom there was an earthquake at that moment and rocks were split in pieces what's more tombs were opened up and many bodies of believers who had died and were buried in their graves were raised they left the tombs and entered the holy city of Jerusalem and appeared to many people. The captain of the guard and those with him 
when they saw the earthquake and everything else that was happening, they were scared to death and they said, this has to be the Son of God. I will stop there. I will encourage you to read all four Gospels the last week of the life of Christ, sometime during Passion Week. It begins today on Palm Sunday when Jesus rode into Jerusalem and all of the people were celebrating their new king who had come to save them now. But within just a few days, every prophecy, the good and the bad, had to be fulfilled. Even though he was the son of God, he also was the son of man. And we see during the last week of his life, the battle going on between his divinity and his humanity right on up until he was on the cross and asked his father why the father had abandoned him. Jesus took all of that suffering so that we wouldn't have to. Now, normally during this time of year and even on Palm Sunday, if we were together live for an in-person service, it would be a wonderful thing to partake of communion together, remembering the Last Supper Jesus had with those he loved the most before his suffering and crucifixion began. But this week, I'm going to give you this instruction and this encouragement. On Good Friday, five days from now, the day we celebrate and commemorate his crucifixion, the price he paid for our sin to be forgiven. On this Good Friday, I'm encouraging each of you to partake of communion alone. Find a solitary place, get some juice and get a cracker. It doesn't have to be kosher. It doesn't have to fit any standard, just whatever juice and whatever cracker you have and uh, on our church Facebook page Friday morning there will be scriptures you can read as you partake of Holy Communion in a solitary place on Good Friday and then one week from today the power will be back on we will gather together for an in-person Easter celebration all the world gets in on this celebration where we give thanks to God for sending his son and for the son suffering in our place so that we could be forgiven of our sin every punishment that should have fallen on us fell on him instead and we're asking God to lift from us this week everything Jesus carried for us. Our sin, our sickness and disease, our death. If you're born of the Spirit, we will never die. We are eternal. And so let me pray for you now as we begin Passion Week together. Father, thank you for the opportunity to revisit the most significant event in the history of the world, the event that changed our calendar, the event that makes every difference between heaven and hell, life and death, and for the millions and even billions who have, over these past 2,000 years, decided to commit their life to following Christ. We are the band of disciples, larger than a small remnant, all over the earth, that come into agreement on this Palm Sunday that we celebrate the Lordship of Jesus and we commemorate the heavy price He paid so that we could benefit from His sorrows and from His suffering. 
I speak a blessing over every member and friend of Abundant Life Church. I pray that even though today is somber, it is Palm Sunday, the beginning of the week, we remember suffering and passion. We look forward already to the victory we know which is coming, and that is Resurrection Day that gives each of us resurrection life eternally. We honor you and we bless you and we thank you for the heavy price you paid that we could have a relationship with God the Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, those few of you who are here with us. We couldn't do it without you. And thank you who are joining us through live stream. May God bless you this Passion Week. Retrace the steps of the Lord when he had less than a week to live. We'll celebrate together his resurrection next Sunday morning. Easter Sunday, be here at 10. God bless you all.